And we are live. All right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I just want to give a couple of minutes for uh, the go live notification to go out there for those who want to join this incredible discussion. We are gathered here today to have a conversation that we feel is very important and very timely right now. Uh, we are living in an amazing time in history. Uh, people are finally paying attention to what we've been saying for decades. The unfair treatment, the fact that we are not being seen or treated the same. Black people in this country have been saying things for decades that some folks are just now catching on. But in this moment, in this time that is so important, and so critical for our people. There are still some conversations that we need to have as a community. There's some things inside our community that we need to talk about. And tonight, we're gonna talk about one of those things. How you doing? My name is Tion. I am the, the uh, founder and executive director of the Centers for Black Excellence. And we are excited to welcome you to our panel discussion today on the importance of fatherhood in the black community, the importance of fatherhood in the black community. I've got some awesome uh, panel guests with me today, but before I introduce them and give them an opportunity to say their words, I wanna, um, I wanna read something to you, kind of set the stage for tonight. I was doing a little bit of research and in my research, here's what I found. And I wanna go ahead and read this to you. Research found that uh, a majority of the uh, over 70 million uh, American children under the age of 18 live in families with two parents. At the time of this um, report, it was about 69% live in a two family household. However, when that's broken down by race, the statistics surprised me because here's what it said, broken down by race, Children under the age of 18 who live with both parents, the, the amount of white children that live with both parents is more than double the amount of black children that have both parents at their disposal. In fact, it goes on to say that approximately 74% of white children live with both, both parents. Meanwhile, less than 38% of black children have access to both parents. It went on to talk about which parent they were staying with, saying that um, about anywhere between 23 to 25% of single family household children um, uh, are, are living uh, with just their mother. It, it's just an astonishing uh, amount of, of information that's out there about what our structures and our communities are looking like. And I felt like it was very important to have this conversation. So I wondered, what kind of an effect? Has there been any research? Has there been any studies or conversations about what effect fatherlessness has on a child in the home? And this is what really blew my mind. Here are some statistics. Children without a father in their lives are four times greater to fall into poverty. Young girls without fathers are seven times more likely to become pregnant as a teenager. Children are more likely to have behavioral problems. They are twice as likely to risk infant mortality. Don't tell me fathers don't matter. The children are more likely to go to prison, more likely to commit crime, more likely to face abuse and neglect. They are more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol they are twice as likely to suffer obesity and twice as likely to drop out of high school. All of these statistics are studying children that come from homes without access to their fathers. So I knew that this was an important conversation that we needed to have in the black community because far too often we are seeing examples of fatherlessness in our communities. And with that, I want to introduce the first of our panelists that will be joining us tonight. Thomas Waters is a motivational speaker whose focus is to motivate people to action, thus allowing them to be the best version of themselves. He is respected. 
for his ability to be authentic and candid with his audiences, as well as his skill for getting them involved during one of his talks. Thomas is an ordained prophet at Victory Christian Center in Southwest Philadelphia and has been a member for almost 20 years. He is the founder and CEO of Men With Vision Incorporated, a nonprofit organization he founded in 2012. Men With Vision, primary mission is to lead men to God or back to God and then help them discover their God-given purpose. They believe in preparing, restoring, and empowering men. Men with vision services include outreach, workshops, preach message, and informational tools that are beneficial to all men. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the first of our great panelists, Mr. Thomas Waters. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Tian, first of all, thank you so much for um, having me come on. When I saw this conversation coming up, like I had to jump on the opportunity um, because it's one of these things that I'm very passionate about, and that's the fact that the, it's so important for fatherhood to be in the Black community. And as we get in later to the conversation, I'll get more in depth in that. But if you look at statistics like you just spoke of, and if you look at the murder rate, especially in cities like Philadelphia and Delaware, I think a lot of that has to do because there's a lack of Black male leadership or Black fathers in the community who are providing guidance. And if we're mm -hmm. going to get past where we are right now and get to the place where we really need to be, we're going to need to need Black men, Black fathers to step up and really start guiding our young Black men as well as our young Black women. Because it's not only important for a Black man to have a father, it's utterly important for a Black woman to have a father in her life, an active father in her life. So I think this conversation is so needed. And it's one of these conversations that we can't just have one time. We need to constantly have it until people start getting it. Because we need to change the perspective or the outlook of how we are looked on as Black men and our mm. communities and not being there as fathers for our children in our community. Right. Which is really not true. Because, right. you know, I drive down the street every day and I see a lot of brothers out there with their kids, taking care of their kids. I know a lot of fathers who are so we got to change that narrative. But one thing we have to do is we have to start with ourselves as first and own up to the fact that some of us as men are not doing what we need to do. Mm. And if we don't know how to do it, then we need to ask somebody. We need to get the tools. We need to get involved in the community and just say, hey, I need help here. I don't know how to be a father. And there's no shame in that. We have to set our pride aside so we can move forward. That is absolutely true. Absolutely incredible. Thank you very much for that. Uh, there were some really powerful things you said in there. Uh, one of the things that immediately stood out to me is that there are some black men that didn't have a father in their house, so they don't feel that they know how to be a mm -hmm. father. That was very powerful. We have another awesome panelist that's with us today to help us. in this. Uh, he is a associate pastor. He is a father. He actually happens to be a good friend of mine. So I know his character. I know his humility. I know um, how, how serious he is about his children and, and those that he mentors and he's in their life. So I want you to help me welcome our second panelist for this incredible discussion, none other than Pastor Calvin Berry. Hey. Um, first of all, I just want to thank um, Tion for um, for this opportunity. When you called me and told me um, uh, for that I was going to be doing this, and I was like, "Me?" I, I, the first thing I said was "Me," and he was like, "Yes, why not you?" And um, I, I thought about that. I thought about it once we got off the phone, and I was like, "Well, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to share um, in a uh, subject that I am absolutely compassionate." Um, about, um, I am, I'm a husband. I, I, um, I have three, uh, children, uh, almost grown. Uh, one is 21, one is, uh, uh, 18 and the other one is um, 17 turning 18 and I got a 19, 18 year old turning 19. So <laughs> I'm almost done. Uh, but I, but I, but what we're going to really deal with tonight is how um, difficult that was. It was not very um, very easy for me. And the reason is because my father didn't come into my life until I was around about maybe 12 years old. 
So that whole entire time, I had no experience of what a man is supposed to do or what a man's supposed to say. Uh, how do you raise, how, how, you know, how do you deal with certain situations? Um, the only thing that I thought of when I, you know, uh, when I started having children, the only fallback that I had really uh, was looking at the Cosby show. Now I'm just being real. Yeah. yeah that was yeah. the only thing, because what would come to my mind is, yeah. What in the world would he Cliff Huxtable do in <laughs> this moment? Right. What, what would he do in this moment? That's the only thing that I really actually had. Now, my father is great. Um, he's in my life. He uh, got out of prison. He's, he's a deacon now. He's doing an amazing, um, great man, all, awesome man. Um, but he just wasn't there for the first um, 10, 11 years of, of, of you know me growing up. So even though you know I've 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 had foster children, I mentor people, and I have my own uh, kids and, and and raising them up, I, I want you to understand that it was not easy. So you know that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, and I, we're just going to share and really get down to the nitty gritty about how important a um, father is in a black community. Uh, it is very very important. Those statistics that you just said, Tian, is yeah. alarming. It is That's alarming. It is. We, we we really should not look. We really should not listen to that and just be like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. No, there, there has to be an empowerment to do something about it. And I think these type of situations, these type of small um, situations like this, um, can bring such an impact. Um, to the world. And I'm just, again, I'm grateful. Thank you so much, Keon, for, uh, for having me. And good to see you, Tom. You too. Guys, I appreciate you. Such incredible comments from the both of you. Let's go ahead and dive into the, the, the meat of this discussion. Um, I want to ask you guys, and, and then I would love to get some responses from each of you as we dive into some of these questions um, that will help drive this conversation forward. And the first question that I want to ask you, and either one of you can jump in first, is what role, if any, did your biological father play in your life and how has that played a role in the man you've become today? Um, I'll start. Mm -hmm. um, my biological father, I don't know his name. According to my mother, the only thing I know his name is to be Daddy No Good. That's wow. all I know about him, okay? So I, to tell you, so I have no idea who my biological father is. Wow. So that in itself started me on a path that took me many years to deal with. And I have to be honest with you, even to today, like I still have a thousand and one questions about my history, my background. So putting this in some yeah. context, growing up without a father was very detrimental for me because although I had a stepdad, he was an alcoholic. So by the time oh, wow. I stopped drinking, I was 18, 19 years old. So therefore, with the exception of my best friend's father at the time who, you know, put some influence in us, but I was angry. I gotta be yeah. honest with you, I was very angry. So I really didn't listen to men a lot of that because I felt like abandoned. So I didn't have a lot of respect for men. So I mm. didn't listen to a lot of men. So unfortunately, wow. I had to go through what they yeah. call the school wow. of hard knocks. You know, yeah, I think you're touching on something really strong right Ooh. here. And I, I, don't, yeah. I don't want the audience to miss that. Yeah. Uh, because Ooh. you talked about the anger Mm -hmm. And and which then turned into rebellion mm -hmm. uh, against other men, authority figures. I mean, did you not just describe so much of what we see happening in our communities on a regular basis? Exactly. But you know what? I think that a lot of guys don't realize and women too, until you own up to that hurt, until you own up to that disappointment, you're going to be in this cycle forever. Like at some point, wow. I had to stop and say, okay, you know what? First of all, I forgive you. Because I don't really know the history there. Wow. I don't know what happened between him and my mother. I don't know. But um, I had to say, I forgive you. And then I had to stop being angry in order for me to move forward. Because if I hadn't mm -hmm. done that, I would have stayed in the cycle of, you know, smoking marijuana, drinking, doing other drugs. This stuff that I had no business doing. But because there was nobody there putting their foot on me and saying, hey, you need to get your ass right. And there was right. nobody that was willing to listen to. So I right. went through that teenage years, just confused, angry, some things happened. So to get to the point, like it is detrimental for a man or woman to have to go through their life and not know who their biological father is. 
And wow. I don't care how old you get, and I'm 61 years old. Yeah. But I still have these questions. I still wow. find myself saying, what would my life have been like had he been there and guided me? That's powerful, man. Uh, Calvin, did you want to uh, add to that? Um, my, um, I guess my story, experience. Yeah, I guess my story is a little um, similar. Let me let me just kind of give you a, a background. Um, you know, I grew up with my my primarily my mother, uh, who was on drugs, um, who was very very sick um, with um, re uh, renal failure, and so I grew up, you know, on the streets of Asbury Park. Um, you know, sometimes sleeping on the curve, um, sleeping on Lake Avenue. Yes, yes, it got that bad. And, um, you know, I, I grew up with this, with knowing that this man was my, was my father and, um, he would come and he would bring child support every day. I mean, what, every uh, week or every month. And my mother would say, go down there and go get that, um, go get that check from your father. And I would go down no way. Yes, I would go down and I would get the check and I'll say, Hey dad, and he'll say, Yeah, yeah, whatever. And 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 like 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 shift the check um on me. And so he never said hi to me, he never said absolutely anything to me, but just gave me the check and drove off. And um I grew up with that memory, and then one and then all of a sudden one day I was complaining to my mother, you know, about this man. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna name his name. He he I just found out this year that he passed. Okay. Uh, but but my mother was like, no, that's not really your actually your father. Your father is 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 such and such. And so my I'm like, wow. So I'm like, where is he at? And she was like, oh, he's in prison. So we went to go see him um in, in prison. And so growing up like that. Um, really play a serious role in my life because I only grew up with women, and the only okay. reason why I'm I'm saved is because of my godmother who kept bringing me to church. Okay. So the only authority figures that I saw in my life were all women. So wow. I I was like you, Tom. I didn't respect men. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, I I did not receive correction from men. Um, right. and even now. I still fight with it. I even, I, and, and I'm going to be real transparent. Okay. I, I, I still struggle with my pastor, with my relationship with him. Wow. Simply because of the way that I grew up, mm -hmm. I didn't grow up with an authority figure in my life. So I moved, I moved once, once my mother passed away, I moved in with my aunt and my uncle. And it was very hard for me to be able to receive him as a, as a father. I was scared of him. Mm -hmm. uh, we, he never, you know, he he was not that talking type of person. Yeah. Um, the time that he talked was with when it came and involved music. Mm -hmm. So that's where my music came from. It came from him, you know, instilling that in me. But how that happened, and then how I grew up, and then becoming a father. Yeah. I had no clue what to do. So when certain situations would come up, I would look at my wife like. You know, I'm I'm, I'm blown away know. right now because I hear the similarities in your story, oh, and I also hear the similarities in the effect that it had on the both of you when Absolutely. it came to other men in your lives, mm -hmm. right? So Absolutely. here it is, you guys, both of you as young men, having no father in the home, and that translated to each one of you as having difficulty acknowledging the authority of any other man that tried to show Absolutely. up. Exactly. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Right. Right. So now I'm looking at our communities. I'm looking at our young men that when we try to go and straighten one of them out or, mm -hmm. you know, if we happen to be the individual in a position of authority, what if this is the same thing that's going through their minds? And this is the reason why they can't receive guidance and correction from us. Mm -hmm. Because they're struggling with the anger and the rejection and the hurt mm -hmm. and the frustration, just like you guys were. Right, exactly. That's some phenomenal insight. Yeah. There is a, uh, a, a you guys can definitely touch on here, uh, awesome question coming in from one of our viewers. Was there a fear of not being a good father or a husband, either from not having an example <laughs> or being the victim of a generational curse as a sense? Like, was there a fear that because you didn't have a dad, 
when it was your turn to be a dad, were you afraid or concerned about what that would look like for you? Um, I'll say this. I don't have any children. I don't have any biological. I don't have any children. And to be honest, I think a part of that is because of the fact that in my younger years, you know, when people are getting married and having children, I wasn't ready. I didn't have the <laughs> mentality for that. And the one thing I was very conscious about, like, I didn't want to wreck a child's life. Like, wow. I, I didn't want to bring a child into this world and not be there for that child. Like, my father was not there for me. Like, I didn't want to do that. So, yeah. if that, you know, when I was in my 20s and early 30s and still trying to find my way and deal with the anger issues, I just made sure I didn't have any children. So, um, wow. you know, that, Wow. You know, it was just a decision that I made because I didn't want to do that to another child. Now, I've been blessed to be a godfather to to um to a phenomenal two a phenomenal young man and goddaughter. So I've had that parenting experience. But right. for me, it was something like I'm not gonna do that. And because it took me longer, but I'm still trying to find myself to get myself together, right. I could not do that to a child. I just wouldn't. Now, what was it about what was going on in your mind? that even made you feel that way in the first place, that made you feel that you being a dad would not be a blessing to that child, but it would be you doing something to that. And I don't want to do that to a child. What what was it that was happening with you that made you feel that way? Because I didn't even know who I was. Mm. <laughs> I'm just going to put it plain and simple. I didn't even know who I was. And the, the sad part about it was, I didn't really realize at that point how angry I really was and how wow. abandoned and how my self-worth was so damaged because the wow. image that I had of myself and my my value was damaged. You know, I didn't see myself as being valuable. I didn't think anybody really loved me and didn't care for me, especially in a man. So therefore, I had that combination of things put together was like, no, I think I had enough at that time wisdom to say, I'm not doing that. You know, wow. Not that, you know, that is amazing. Powerful. But and, and I'm going to I think this is probably going to wind up being a theme that we come back to and something that as as black men in our community, we need to deal with. I keep hearing the word angry. Mm -hmm. That yeah. tends to be a yeah. common response, yeah. a common thread that right. uh, is flowing through the emotional uh, nature of those who haven't had a father in the home. Let's move to the second question here, because I think this, uh, this will kind of start to shift the conversation uh, from the problem and more towards the solution. Um, each of you talked about not really having your father in your life, your biological father. So what other men, if any, help shape you into the man that you are today? And how important would you say their presence was in your life now that you're looking back? Okay. Calvin, you want to dive into that one first, please? Um, I, I'm going to, I, they, they, there's two men. Um, well, you know, I, I, I got to include my father because after he got out of prison, he really um, turned his life around and, and was really there in my life. He's still there. He still is in my life. Um, but I would say um, my my uncle, who I moved with, um, helped mm. shape me who who I am today. Even though I was afraid of him, even though I never really talked to him, um, I just sat and just watched. Yeah, I just watched how he handled um, certain situations. I watched how he handled arguments with my aunt, uh, which is my, you know my mom, and 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 um, I just watched how he you know, handled um, situations. But another man, I, I want to say, is a white man. Okay. It was a white man. Uh, he was my ROTC uh, major in in in, um, in in high school, mm -hmm. and the reason why he had a profound impact on my life, um, because we were uh, essentially re get ready to get dressed, you know, put on our um, um, civics and different things like that. And um, he came to me. He said, um, "Barry, what, what's up with your tie? What's wrong with your tie?" Uh, and I and I looked at him. I was like, "I don't, I don't know how to tie a tie." He looked at me. He, his eyes got big, and he just sat there. He was like, "Wait here, Barry." And he went, and, you know, and, and whatever. He came. And he said, "You come here." And, um, so I came out, and he took me to his office personally. 
and said, I am so sorry that no man has ever taught you wow. how to tie a tie. Wow. And his name is Major Robert Snyder. And he taught me how, I mean, he went through the steps. He stood, he stood there with me until I got it. It yeah. took me a long time until I got it, but he stood right there. He didn't move. He didn't go nowhere. It, it, it was it, the period has gone had, had went. He said, "Don't worry, I'll write you a note." He did not leave there until I got that, and that had a profound um, wow. um, um, sense of value on my life because that's exactly what I do with my children now. I, you're not if, if my children need me right now, I, I do whatever I have to do to make sure that I'm there to be able to listen, and I don't leave that conversation until you know. There, there has been a resolution. All those years ago, that happened how many years ago? Man, I've been out of high school for what, 20 something years. So this is an encounter you had over 20 years ago. Yeah. And left that much of an impact on Absolutely. your life to the Absolutely. point where that becomes one of your point of references with how you even deal with your own children. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. fantastic. That's fantastic. Tom, did you want to uh, jump in there? What what men uh, outside of your father, what men played a role in helping to shape the man? Sure. Um, when I grew up um, going through junior high school, um, I was I befriended twins. You know, <laughs> I was a good friend with both the twin brothers. And okay. they had a father, you know, they were actually a stepfather. But he was their father as far as I was concerned. And I remember yeah. going to their house one day to pick up to go to school. And he comes down, his name was Mr. Clark. He's no longer with us now. And he says, um, your shoes need to shine. And that was the first time <laughs> I had met him. And so I'm sitting there and he goes away. And he comes back. He said, did you not hear me? Your shoes need to shine. Go upstairs <laughs> and shine your shoes before you get out of here. And it was something about the way that he said it that made me get up out of my chair, not uh -huh. think twice about it, and go upstairs uh -huh. and shine my shoes. And from wow. that point on, he would always, you know, drop nuggets, you know, all throughout our teenage years. But I got to be honest, it, were, it is one man who I credit with really gives me the father influence that I need. That is my pastor. Like wow. My pastor is my spiritual father. But as far as I'm concerned, he is a father. You know, wow. he has guided me. He has listened to me. He's rebuked me. He's really understood where I came from walked me through some difficulties and then yeah. just really started building value in me. You know, he really started saying, you know, you have all this, you have gifts, you have that, you have this, you have that. And he really yeah. listened. So um, although I was grown then and I was actually, I had turned my life to a really good point, but you can always grow. But to have somebody that I actually listen to and have a real father figure, it is my pastor. Wow. Now, wow. It is. Good. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. Now I'm I'm with you guys. Um, the story of my life. I I didn't grow up with my biological father. Uh, mm. Didn't know him. Uh, I actually met him for the very first time in my thirties. Um, wow. I, I I didn't. He never bothered to be in my life. Uh, he always had a way to to reach me. He didn't live in the state, um, but the phone number that he had access to when I was born never changed my entire life. That, wow. that phone number remained exactly the same. He always knew that there was a way to find me or reach me. He just never chose to. Mm -hmm. And the very first time I had ever actually met him, I was in my 30s. I had wow. already gotten past the anger. I can relate with the anger that you're speaking about because how dare he not be in my life? Like, how dare you? Yeah, yeah. Not, yeah. I feel like there's this anger that at the time we don't know how to put into words, mm -hmm. but we yeah. know we're mad. Right. If you ask yeah. me why I'm mad, I couldn't tell you. I might even tell you I'm not. Leave me alone. Right. But yeah. I know I'm mad. And and I think when you get older, you realize you you were supposed to teach me how to be a man. Exactly. Where yeah. were you? I'm yeah. looking back on all the mistakes I made mm -hmm. because I feel like I didn't have the guidance to be the best man I could be. And look at all the people I've hurt. Look at all the bad scenarios I found myself in because I didn't have that guidance. And maybe the anger towards other men exists because you're not the person I want to get this guidance from. You're not my dad. Like right. I'm looking for my dad and it's not you. So get out of the way. Right. 
right? Exactly. When I finally met this man, um, he says to me, if his children want a relationship with him, they need to contact him. Wow. Find him and reach out to him. And uh, I talked to my mom about that, you know, after the whole experience and uh, she shared something with me. It's that it was generational. <laughs> he didn't have his dad. Okay. And his dad didn't have his dad. Wow. Life. And so um, my, my children, uh, I, I'm, that is my biggest soft spot. I'm, I'm all mm -hmm. over my kids. And I think it's because I made a decision to be the man that my father never was. Now, I thank God for the man that did raise me. My stepfather, he's been in my life uh, for as far back as I can remember, over 20 something years, he's been in my life. So I'm very grateful to him. Um, he's not a very talkative man. So it's not like we had those father, son sit downs. Son, mm -hmm. let, let me tell you some things you, <laughs> right, you need to right. know. We didn't have those that that wasn't really his forte. But Calvin, like you said, and, and I thought that that was very awesome to touch on, like you said, uh, he was a visual example. Mm -hmm. There were some things I saw. Mm -hmm. right? And the things that I saw spoke to me louder than the words he could have possibly said. Mm -hmm. exactly. Right? Yeah. And, yeah. and maybe that's one of the things that we could share with any men that are watching this today is that you may not know exactly what to do, uh, you may not feel you have all the money or all the time or all the anything to give to your children, but I want to tell you that for the better or for the worse, your children are watching you. That's right. Yeah. Right. And they are learning something from your behavior. Right. Either they are learning how to properly treat people mm -hmm. or they are learning how to mistreat people. people. But either way, they're learning from your behavior. They're learning from your presence. And they are learning from your absence. That's, that's right. Yeah. There is nothing you can do to not be your be be the dad, whether you're the dad who's present and right. you're learning from what they see, or you're the dad who's absent and you're teaching them something from your absence. That's it. Exactly. Right? Either that's way, right. we gotta be there. Right. So on that note, guys, let me ask you this. Um to Calvin, I wanna I wanna ask you, and, and Tom, you said that you are a godfather to some mm -hmm. children. So obviously you take on that fatherly role in that mm -hmm. aspect. So let me ask you, um, considering the way you grew up, what drives you to be the father you are today? Both for your biological children, Calvin, and for the godfather and how seriously you take your role as a godfather. Uh what what's what drives you to be that way? Okay. Calvin, you want to go on? Go ahead, Tom. Okay. Um, for me, not having a father, <laughs> really just yeah. simple, you know, not having a father. My guy told me the best because they have a phenomenal father. You know, like I've known their father since he was 14 years old. So he really didn't have a choice but to be a good father. But he uh -huh. has allowed me to play such an integral part in their lives. So one of the things that I always tell my guy's son is the fact that I love you. Oh, my God, Jordan. Constantly, consistently. Like we don't end a phone conversation or a text without me saying, I love you. Because I want them to feel love because I didn't feel I didn't hear those words growing up. And right. then just the fact to, to be able to give them advice, you know, when they I always let my guys sons know, um, first of all, you got your father, your grandfather, your uncle, and when you can't talk to any of them, give me a call. And even if you don't want to talk to them, give me a call. And we can talk about it. And they've been, especially my oldest godson, who is my heart. I've been in his life since day one when he was born. When they asked me to be his godfather, and I was wow. so excited because it was like my opportunity to be a father. Yeah. So you know, I yeah. have spoiled yeah. this child, <laughs> and you know, corrected this child, had a ball with this child, and now he's twenty-one. He's in his um, second, going on third year in college, and he's a phenomenal uh, man. But I tried wow. to give him. And be that thing that I did not have. Mm -hmm. You know, like I wanted to set the right. example. Of, I encouraged right. him. You know, when he went on his little spree, as we all do, you got to find yourself. He had a year. I wanted to choke him, but you know, we gave him the space to do what he needed to do to find himself. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know? there were a couple times, yeah. Calvin, you yeah. can find me a test for the nineteen year old. You took the guy. I just wanted to strangle him, but I love him and I love him unconditionally, even when he was being crazy. 
And so our relationship is so good, but yeah. I just tried to give him what I did not have. Yeah. 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 So, that's incredible. Calvin. Wow. Same for me. You, you're, um, the, you're, you're the father to like 755 <laughs> uh, foster children. Talk, talk, talk a little bit about why I say that, Calvin. Um, oh, yeah. you, you don't just have your own biological children, but there are others that you're literally raising in your own home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had I've had um, four, uh, and then in addition to my three, I've had four more foster children um, in my <laughs> in my home. Uh, I've 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 got got I've had godchildren um, in, in my home, um, living li literally living uh, in my home, and yeah. uh, and and everybody is is brother and sister. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was not easy at all. Yeah. Uh, um, but I, 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 what drives me um, is not having that father in my life. I, I still have images of going to that car and mm -hmm. saying, hi, dad, and no response. Wow. I, I don't think people understand what that does to a boy. Wow. When your father or this supposedly father is supposed to respond. Yeah. Doesn't even respond at all. It just gives me the check and drives off. And that's the image that I keep having in my head. Wow. That guy just giving me a check and just driving off. Wow. So every, so whenever my children need me, the, the First thing that comes to my mind is, is that man coming to my house, wow, giving me a check and then driving off. I said, I, 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 I cannot do that to my own children, and, wow. es and especially with girls, right? Especially with girls, yes, with boys, um, you know, but especially with girls. Um, so that's yeah. what drives me every day is that image. Um, it, it it still haunts me to this day, and yeah. he's he's no longer in, he was no longer in my life, and it still bothers me. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the reasons why I say I, I don't I don't have great relationship with men mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm always thinking you're only in my life to give me something and go. Wow! Wow! wow. Calvin, that's wow. crazy. So. So you literally just said this interaction with this man who you call dad for all of this time has even into your adult years shaped the way you formulate your interactions with other men. Absolutely. And I'm not and and and, and Tia, I'm not ashamed to say that. That's so I, how many times my, my, my pastor have come to me and say, hey, you we need to do this, we need to do this, we need to do that. And I'm I'm just looking at him and I love him. I respect him. Mm -hmm. I, I even call him dad. Um, but there's always an image of what do you want from my life? Are, are you here to just give me what I I, I want and then you're out of here? Mm -hmm. Wow. So that really shaped my life, and that's something that I constantly pray. And ask God to be able to kill me um, in that area, so that I can be able to have better relationship with men. So yeah. that, that you know that plays a big role in my life because I just can't have my children just to be able to just hear and just and I I just leave and I go, bro. I, I'm telling you, I stop whatever. I'm, I don't care where I am, <laughs> bro. Right. I, I was in I was in 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 Leipzig, Germany. And and my my wife called me and she said, "Hey, we have a, I'm, I'm having some issues with some issues with Isaiah, and they're talking about doing this. They're talking about doing that. Blah 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 blah." I stopped what I was doing. And now we're talking about maybe like ten o'clock at night, right? Um, and I because you know it's it's the uh, Elwood oh, different. I called the school, and mm -hmm. um, they was like, "Oh, the teacher is 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 busy right now." I said, "Listen, I'm calling from Leipzig, Germany." We need to get her on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And the lady was like, oh, 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 oh my God, I'm so sorry. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me just see if I can just be able to get her. And I did not yeah. leave the phone until we had a conversation. My whole mindset is I don't want my children ever wow. in their lives to be able to say that my father just gave me a check and left. Wow. Wow. So now that is this how it affected you and this is a great place to shift this conversation because of something you said and something i see in the comments so thank i'm grateful to all those that are watching live and are, and are commenting um you mentioned something not just about your son uh but for a moment there you slid in talking about your daughter and so i began to see some of these conversations popping up i'm a huge daddy's girl daddy's girls in the house Absolutely. And what that made me want to transition to is this, Calvin, you have daughters as well. Tom, mm -hmm. you have goddaughters as mm -hmm. well. So mm -hmm. I need to, I have daughters. So, so we've talked about the impact from personal experience that we know not having a father has had in our lives. Mm -hmm. My question is, have you had any interactions um, or any any uh, firsthand dealings or anything dealing with women that did not grow up with fathers in the house and how it has affected them, or as a father, do you have do you father your daughter the way you do because of all you know what you know about when it comes to to girls that don't have their fathers in their lives. And if you're watching, uh, if you want to comment on this as a woman, especially those that just uh, listed in the comments, the effect that you've noticed or you've seen the difference between girls who grew up with their father and girls who grew up without their father in the home. Have you seen it, experienced it, noticed it? What can you say about that? Tom, I saw some big yeah. head over there. You want to go ahead and jump on that one? Okay. So first of all, let me say, my guy daughters who are uh, the most precious thing in the world to me, you know, they are spoiled rotten. They have to be wrapped around the entire finger. All they got to do yeah. is fall. And they, my oldest guy daughter is in Atlanta now. And she calls or texts, God, probably got some money. I'm like, I'll move heaven and earth to get this child some money. Wow. Uh, but growing up, I knew some young ladies who did not have a father in the house. And I watched them make some really bad decisions, especially wow. with the men that they got involved in, because they really didn't wow. have an example of what, how a man should really treat them. You know, mm. I've, I've, I know women who stay in abusive relationships only because they somehow thought that you had to do that. You know, old school thinking used to be, you know, you marry this guy, you stay there with them, if he's abusive and all, you know, you pray it away and it'll all be okay. You know, <laughs> a lot of women got caught up in that. Uh, Calvin, am I correct? You know, that, that's old school True. thinking. That's and yeah. so I watched a lot of um, friends of mine, women friends that I've grown up with, and I know they've dealt with that abuse and that lack of self-esteem. And you can genuinely tell that by the type of guy that a woman picks out and the way mm. she allows him to treat her. Wow. So always there. Because every girl needs a dad, is looking for a daddy. Every woman I talk to, I have a lot of female friends and we've had this conversation and they are all always want a, a daddy, a father. They want that, they need that. It's like that protector. They need that to be a protector. If they don't find it in their father, then they're looking for it for someplace else. And what happens is they get into these relationships and they're not protectors, they're controllers. But because Woo! of the difference between the two, they're caught up in that. That's good. You know what? This comment came in right on time, exactly what you were just talking about. We have somebody that, that is literally referring to it. Watch this. This woman says, in, in, in perfect con, um, in, in perfect uh, mirror to what you were saying, I stayed single because I knew how a man was supposed to treat a woman, but at the mm -hmm. same time, a good choice eventually because I have a good father. Excellent. Right? Wow. So because she had a father present in her life, she was able to tell the difference between the knuckleheads mm -hmm. and the guys who were worth her time. Right. Right. There was there was the opportunity there to be able to see a good example mm. so that you know what's not good. 
Exactly. And and I, I agree wholeheartedly. It looks like we got a lot of people in the comments that are agreeing as well wholeheartedly that 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 happens. Because like, Calvin, have you had any, you know, seen anything like this or or, or know anything about this or as a father of little girls yourself? Mm hmm. Does that weigh into your thought processes? Oh, own? yes, it does. I, I um, you, you know, me and me, uh, my wife and I, we're opposites. Uh, <laughs> I, you, know, you know, my wife, she is no nonsense type of person. She is cut and dry. She is black and white. Uh, <laughs> it, you know, at, at times she can, she will not have sympathy for her. <laughs> none, of, none of what you're saying. She's like, yeah, I hear you, but such and such and such and such and such. She yeah. is black and white all the way. Um, I am not that type. I am the the the, the um, I'm melancholy um, in my nature, I'm very mellow, and I'm the one that my daughters. I'm the first one if they have any type of issues. I'm pretty sure I'm pretty much the first um, person that they come to. Okay, and, and it's and, and a lot of times I have to turn them away and say, hey, that that's not my. No, you need to go talk to her <laughs> about that. That's issue that I don't need to know about. Please go. Oh, but, but 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 I'm oh, but I'm but, but my heart is so rich that they're able to be able to come to me and just be like, hey, this is what my issue is. And sometimes I gotta pry it out of them, and and then it just it just comes out. And whatever, and so that that you know plays a, a huge role, you know. I, and then you, I even got goddaughters who won't even talk to their own father. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, you know, they'll talk to me quicker than their old than their old father, and 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 have said to me personally, "You the only father I got." And I'm like, "No, your father is. You you can call." Yeah, you're you're actual mm -hmm. biological. I'm not. I'm not that. I'm. I'm just God. I'm just not far. And they're like, no, no, you're my dad. Wow. And I'm like, wow. I I I don't know what I have done. I think it's just I just been there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For what, for what needs to what, for what needs to be happening? You know what needs to uh what they whatever they need to talk about or or relate to and. Yeah. and so that's played a big a big role, but that I I didn't see that growing up. So I'm like I'm just gonna be that. I'm okay. just gonna be that man to be able to make sure that I am there for anything. And like I said, there are some stuff I should not be there for. And I, I <laughs> not my go talk to your mom. mom. That's not my conversation, huh? Mm -hmm. You need to see, go. That's the beauty of having a two parent. <laughs> situation right because right. each right. can play your roles right exactly so, exactly so daddy can be protector confidant yeah. provider but that thing right there go mm -hmm. talk to your mom <laughs> talk, take that over there to your mama <laughs> right. right now see you you there's a few things that i hear you guys touching on and i've seen it in my own life i feel like you can almost always almost always there's always exceptions to the rule but you can almost always tell the girl that doesn't have daddy in her life. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You you can okay. almost mm -hmm. always mm -hmm. tell the girl that when daddy ain't home. That's right. And, and yeah. even, even in my experiences, when I was younger, you know, when I was a, a teenager, you know, self-proclaimed, you know, little, little, little player or whatever, whatever I wanted to call myself. I always knew the girls that didn't have a daddy at home. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You right. always knew. You did. Right. Always. And not only that, but then the girls who did have a dad at home, I was a little nervous about mm -hmm. because I knew a couple of things. The first thing I knew, mm -hmm. I wasn't going to get away with a lot. No. Right. That was number one. Mm -hmm. uh, and if this girl not only had a daddy at home, but had a good relationship with her dad, mm -hmm. over, we wasn't doing nothing. Right. This is not going down. I actually <laughs> had one girl talk to me. She told me she was like, oh, yeah, I got a really good relationship with my dad. I tell him everything. And I started to sweat. <laughs> <laughs> you have a good relationship with your dad. You tell him everything. All right. <laughs> not doing nothing. <laughs> not going down. Nothing. Wow. And so 
even now as a dad, as a father of, of, you know, little girls, I think about the same thing. And I'm like, that's why it's so important to me to have a relationship with her where she knows she can talk to me. She can come to me. Um, you know, she can confide in me because I know that it, you know, those, I, you can always tell, you can always tell, girl, you ain't got no daddy at home. Do you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you, yep. you looking, you looking for a daddy. Yeah, right. Like you said, you looking for that. You looking for somebody to come in and be strong and, mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. That, that's what you looking for. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And then we know we knew just how to position ourselves to be in that position. But when the daddy was involved, mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you. Um, and, and so even when you look at that. And then you look at the the, the rates of, I, I feel like one of the best deterrents, um, so much of our society is sexualizing everything, mm -hmm. right? You can't turn on the TV. Even shows meant for teenagers are still talking about teenagers being in sexual situations. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's doggone near impossible for you to control like the, the uh, exposure of your child to things of a graphic nature. Yeah. But I think, personally that there is no greater deterrent to things like teenage pregnancy you know uh early you know early childhood pregnancy than an active involved father that has a good relationship with their child mm -hmm. it doesn't prevent it 100 percent of the time no it doesn't right. it will always be that no, it, it is right. not a a, a preventative no. but no. i think that it is definitely a deterrent Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that it plays an incredible role, especially when you know your daughter, your daughter knows you, you guys talk all the time. Uh, Calvin, you've got daughters in the home. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that if I were to talk to one of your little girls and ask them, why don't you do some stuff? The answer would be twofold. One, I don't want my daddy to kill me. And two, I don't want to disappoint my dad. Mm -hmm. Right. That's and true. so, again, just tapping on the importance of, of having that father in the life of a child. The, it, it, it's not just making a difference when they're young. These are things that are carrying with this child their entire lives. Guys, let's begin to wrap it up with this last question right here. Sure. Um, it seems to me, and Tom, you, you said something in the uh, intro. So this would be a great moment to be able to uh, kind of mm -hmm. dive on that. Is it really, is it a false narrative? Is the idea of the black man not wanting to be there for his kid, is this a false narrative that's based on a small amount of people that is just being highlighted? Or is it really more like an epidemic where there is a significant amount of men that are not standing up in their role as fathers? Tom, I know that you have an organization that works with men. Can mm -hmm. you speak to this based on your experience? Sure, you know, this is one of the conversations that I have with men on a consistent basis. And the conclusion that we've come to, I come to, I think it's a false narrative based upon mm. a small group of men. So yeah. as you said, I'm a little older than most of you guys. So in my era, it was, a, you know, men just, they didn't step up, they disappeared. But I watch it all the time now where men, I know phenomenal men, young men who have their children, want to be involved in the children's lives. But mm -hmm. where the issue gets tricky, we don't have enough time to touch this topic, is when women won't allow the man to be in that child's life. And this yeah. is where we get the narrative now, the perception that men, especially black men, yeah. don't want to be in their child's yeah. lives. Yeah. And I've talked to men after men after men from all age groups, and I know for a fact the majority of them, that's not true. But the problem is because I no longer want to have a relationship with you, then therefore you can't have a relationship with the child. I'll let you see the child. And wow. that is so damaging. And then the other thing we have to be concerned about is what are you saying about the child's father when he's not in your presence? Mm. Like, like I told you before, my dad is known as daddy nickname. You know, I honestly think my mother must have saw him when she saw me based upon some of the things that we went through. So wow. you, you got to be very careful when we're painting that narrative because that's the perception out there that is so wrong. There, are, I know for a fact there are more black men who want to be in their father's lives. If they want to be there, we need to let them be there. Whether they have the financial support right now, and I can see everything is not about money. Mm -hmm. You know, what be important to our children's lives is not always what comes out of our wallet. It's the wisdom. It's wow. the basic thing as teaching yeah, them how to tie yeah. 
That's what I wanted. Basketball. Yeah. Those things are crucial. So, like, I, I do everything in my power to break that narrative down because, in my opinion, with the guys that I talk to, that's not true. Yeah, there are some because there's some in everything, but that's not the all. That's not the whole picture. That is awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, you hit so many powerful things, one after the other, after the other. And you're right. I wish we had even more time to expound on those things. And we will mm -hmm. in a future conversation. But this was amazing. And you, the one thing that I do want to touch on, and I hear this a lot, uh, I have a brother who struggles financially sometimes, and it weighs mm -hmm. on him because he wants to do more for his daughter. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I want to touch on this real quick because mm -hmm. the other thing you talk about, we will actually have that conversation. But the two biggest things that I feel like keep people who actually want, fathers who want to be in their kids' lives, they either they have a bad relationship with the mom and the mother mm -hmm. is not allowing it, usually for a financial or an emotional reason, because I don't mm -hmm. like you. I don't get along with you. I don't want you in my kid's life or <clears throat> because you ain't giving me no money. I don't want you in the kid's life. Um, those things are happening. And then the other thing that I've also seen happening is when men keep themselves out of their kids' lives because they don't mm -hmm. feel like they have anything to offer. All right. Yeah. Right. I, I, I'm a, I don't have nothing to offer. I, I ain't got no money. I'm broke. I, let me go get my money right. Right. So that I mm -hmm. could do better by my kid. And I want to tell you that your kid get, get the money right. Sure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because we right. need to have expenses yeah. and bills. Yeah. And that woman didn't make that child by herself. She shouldn't have to take care of that child by herself. Exactly. Absolutely. Get your money right. But can I tell you what that child needs more than your money? Mm -hmm. Your presence. That's right. Oh. That's it. For example, That's it. Mm -hmm. there is so much that that child is going to learn just by looking at you. Right. Just by seeing you. You speak so much louder with your presence. That's the right. way that you carry yourself, the way you talk. And that's why you really want to make sure that you're the, you, you, you want to keep trying to be the best version of yourself that you can be. But you need to be present in your child's life. Because right. as you've heard in the stories from these gentlemen, there were stories that weren't based on what someone directly said to them, but merely just the presence in their life became an example that they that stayed with them for the rest of their lives. Absolutely. So, yeah, that was absolutely amazing. Uh, I, I, I see the comments lighting up. Tom, you really touched on something there, right? Uh, wisdom, time, affection, these things cannot be bought. Exactly. exactly. Absolutely, do need, so true. they need so your true. presence. presence. Need you to be present, right? So, uh, absolutely incredible conversation. I want to take a moment, real quick, just to thank our panelists. I want to give you each an opportunity just to share some final words with our audience. Uh, Tom, as you share your final words, would you please do me a favor and make sure you do speak about your incredible nonprofit that you have uh, going on? Um, we started with. We started the intros with Tom, I believe. So, mm -hmm. uh, Calvin, if you could go ahead and just share with us your final thoughts as we get ready to bring this one panel to a close. Uh, and then, Thomas, if you could share with us some of your final thoughts. And then we'll go ahead and close this thing out for tonight. Calvin? Yeah. Um, I just want to say um, uh, there are men out there that really feel like they can't be there because they're not there for um, financially and, and, and those different things. And, and again, um, like Tion said, you know, get the finance right. But in the meantime, black men, just be there. Just be there. You may not, here's the thing. You may not know what to do. <laughs> and it's okay. You may not know what to say. And it's okay. You may not know how to respond, and it's okay. Just the fact that you're there and your presence is there speaks so much volume mm -hmm. to your to your children's life. I, I told you, I did not know what to do. When certain situations would come up, my my mind would say, "What would he he Cliff Huxable do?" <laughs> yeah. That was the only example of a real family. Or a real father or a real husband, even spilled up into my into my marriage life. Listen, just men, just be there. Get, get the finances right. Because it takes a lot of money to be able to raise a child, especially now. Mm -hmm. But a child needs you to be there. 
-hmm. And then once you get there, learn how to just sometimes listen and not always want to respond. Mm -hmm. That is something that I'm learning now. Now that I have, now that I'm going into the stage of grown, grown situation, is just sit and just listen. Sometimes they just need for you to just be there, just to hear, and it makes such a big difference. Um, in their lives. So if, if any final thought that I can be able to give, man, just be available. Mm-hmm. When they call, be available. Do what you have to do to stop what you're doing to make sure that you are that you are there. That's my Thank final you thought. so much. Absolutely incredible. Tom, if you could just go ahead and share with us your final thoughts on tonight's topic. Sure. I, I just want to encourage men who are fathers and their to, like you just said, Calvin, to just be present. So understand this, understand that you have value. You have Mm. to understand that you have value, you have wisdom, Mm. you do have something to pass on Mm. to that child. Like Mm -hmm. you said, yeah, get the money right, that's definitely needed. But outside of that, you have to know within yourself, regardless of what society says or what somebody else is saying about you, you really have to know who you are and what Mm. you can offer to that child. See, mm. we yeah. gotta stop comparing ourselves to other people because yeah. Johnny da- Johnny's dad drives a BMW and I'm driving a Hyundai. That don't make a difference. But I'm spending all my time in my Hyundai with my child while Johnny's dad is in the office 50 and 60 hours a week. You really yeah. gotta understand. See, children value, like you said, presence. They value you being in their lives. They value talking to them listening to what they have to say and sharing your wisdom with them. Because the more you do that, the more you can rest assured they will come to you when things get hard, when they have problems, when they're getting tempted with the outside world. Because we got to understand as men and as parents, we only have a small child um, window of right. influence. Right. The outside uninfluenced. That's right. To our That's so life. good. So it's our duty Small. as fathers to put the influence in there as soon as you possibly can. So that's, that's my okay. thought. Um, I have an organization as known as Men Division. We're a nonprofit organization. We are all about helping men, really helping men to get back to God or get a relationship with God, and then helping them to find that purpose that God has given them. Um, can I give my um, web address? Yes, yes. You can, please. Find me, you can find us on menwithvision.org. That's one word, menwithvision.org. We got a couple of things coming up, but we do have a mentoring program that we're working through now. Uh, we mentor young, young men, old men, um, teenagers, youth. We believe in their whole, so somebody can have a positive experience with a black man. That's right. That's good. And this conversation was definitely, definitely invaluable. Thank you so much, Tia. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you very much be for being a part of it. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you being a part of this conversation. And with that, um, I just want to thank every last one of you that tuned in to this awesome, uh, necessary, vitally important conversation. Again, we here at the Centers for Black Excellence believe that we're in an amazing time in our history as Black people in this country. Uh, And in order for us to take full advantage of the moment that we're in, there are some important conversations that we have to have as a community. We've got to do some things a little bit better in our community so that we can together come up and take advantage of this moment that we're in in history. So I want to thank each one of you for taking the time out of your night tonight and being a part of this and everybody who tuned in. Uh, Please feel free to run over to our website. Um, It is the Centers for Black Excellence dot org. Go there, see our mission, see what we're doing. We are all about um, uh, promoting unity um, to uh, promote education and promoting financial empowerment in the black community. This is what we're doing. Gentlemen, uh, I'm going to reach out to each one of you guys via email uh, as panelists, as guest panelists on the show. I want to provide each one of you uh, with one of the shirts that we use in order to promote black unity in the black community, which is this shirt right here. Yeah, I love it. Unity, uh-huh. the black community. This is our official shirt for our nonprofit. I want to make sure that we get one to each one of you guys in the mail just for participating 
in today's um, panel discussion. If you would like to get one of these shirts as well, uh, anything that you get, any shirt that you do decide to get is just going to support the mission that we have here. We are doing everything from providing scholarships to students, educational panels for the community, uh, supporting local nonprofits. Uh, we're even helping black people become homeowners. So we're doing a little bit of everything and uh, anything that you do in order to join us is going to be very helpful. Listen, join us right back here again next week. We are going to have another panel discussion. Our discussion next week will be the unprotected black woman. Woo. Wow. We got to talk about how we're treating our women Whew. in our communities. We're not going to talk about how anybody else is treating them. We're going to talk about how we are treated. Wow. Our black women in our communities. Guys, we're going to come up to this next level. We got to have a couple conversations on the way. So join us right back here next week, same time, 8 p.m., right here on Facebook Live. We are going to discuss the unprotected black women. We have some amazing panelists that are going to be joining us. I know it's going to be a great conversation, and I hope you'll join us then. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, be on the lookout for more that we're doing. Thank you, Pastor Calvin Berry. Thank you, Tom Waters. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you. All of our viewers, all of our commenters, and we will see you next time on another conversation. And that'll do it for us right here. We are the Centers for Black Excellence. We thank you for joining in. Have a great night and take care. Right. Thank you. Thank you.